Until the pandemic came and hit us, I think a lot of people were not quite so aware as to how much our lives are impacted by global events that might start anywhere. This is a real crisis. I mean, it's been clear that this was likely to spread in the U.S. We need to be thinking much more ambitiously. Climate finance is a very big issue. We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. CGD came about because it was time to focus not only on what developing countries should do, but much more on what the rich world should do. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? Some of our previous work has helped to come up with a kind of innovative financing mechanism that was used to help launch pneumococcal vaccines. We really have researchers and experts here at CGD who come at these issues from multiple vantage points and I think that's just what helps make our research more rigorous, more rich and actually more connected to the realities that decision makers are grappling with. We've been looking to CGD for all of your research and analysis uh, to guide us. So CGD is nonpartisan. Because of that, over the years, that credibility has given us significant convening power. Our government highly values the work. What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. Every single time that we're able to get it right, it means you know, we're reducing significant poverty. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Welcome. Uh, good morning to those of you on the East Coast of the United States and around the world. Um, today, we're really pleased to host an event that looks at the latest in a series of shocks that the global economy and people around the world have had to face. Um, we've been dealing with uh, COVID-19 pandemic, a protracted pandemic. We've been dealing with the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and now we're seeing, of course, high inflation around the world and the ongoing impact of climate change and drought, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa. All of this is exacerbating already unstable food access and causing price volatility, food price volatility, fertilizer price volatility, and many other uh, kinds of commodities. You know, I think if we read the news, we think, oh, well, uh, so the ships are leaving Ukraine, the, the problem's over. No, it's not over. Unfortunately, the events of the past several months will have knock-on effects for harvests going into the next growing season. And um, there's much more going on in terms of the dynamics caused by the conflict and the geopolitical situation right now in the world. But to talk about all of this, um, we're joined today by the Food and Agriculture Organization's chief economist, Maximo Torero Cullen. Um, he works on uh, with governments, uh, along with the rest of the agency, to achieve food security for all and make sure that people have regular access to high quality food to lead active, healthy lives. They look not just at food security, they look at hunger, they look at nutrition issues. So we've asked Maximo to tell us a little bit about what is happening in this uh, area of food security. Is this last week's shock or is this something that's going to have a protracted impact on well being over the next year? What is FAO doing? Um, we know there are many plans to respond to the food security crisis. Uh, in the pre conversation, Maxim mentioned at least four international plans to respond to what's going on today. So we'll look at how well the international community is doing responding to this crisis, what else needs to be done. Um, and he has also proposed along with colleagues, a food import financing mechanism to reduce import costs that we'll ask him to speak about and discuss. I'm joined also by my colleague, Ian Mitchell, who's the co-director of development cooperation in Europe and a senior policy fellow here at the Center for Global Development. And we'll also welcome your comments and questions on YouTube or on Twitter 
hashtag CGD talks. So without further ado, we'll take it, I'll turn it over to Maximo to give us an introduction on what is going on and what to expect. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, and thank you, Ian, for the kind invitation. So what I will do is a, a brief presentation and then more than happy to answer any of, of your questions. So let, let me start uh, talking that this is not just an issue of the short term. It's an issue that has happened before, of course, with some differences, and we will elaborate on those. But what is important today is that uh, even before uh, the war in Ukraine, we have a uh, a significant amount of people, 111 million people uh, facing hunger in 2020. And this was up in 161 uh, million uh, with respect to what was two years before. So COVID-19 has a huge effect. And when we try to look at what are the major drivers and we have to rank them uh, of the crisis that we're observing in several countries in the world, the first driver is conflict, internal conflict. The second one is economic slowdowns and downturns. And that's where COVID-19 play a significant role because it creates economic slowdowns and downturns in many countries. And the third one is, is climate change. And climate brings two elements, extreme weather situations, so too hot, too, too much water, or also significant variability, which affects uh, the way farmers can make a decision. And all of this, of course, affects the cost of diets and the cost of healthy diets, the cost of availability of healthy diets. Now, if we look at the at the numbers, uh, in 2021, we have 828 million people suffering from hunger, from chronic hunger. This is the structural problem. It's different to acute food insecurity, which is normally what WFP will refer to and what IPC refers to, which is more a short-term problem of lack of food. But if you don't take care of it, you can become chronically undernourished. And that's the number that we publish as part of, of FAO. Uh, of this, the, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the estimation of the increase since uh, COVID-19 is 150 million more people uh, in 2019 suffering from chronic hunger. And this is affecting all the regions of the world. Now, the level of intensity varies region by region, but as you can see in the right-hand side of this graph, all of them have been affected. So this is already happening before the war in Ukraine. What the war in Ukraine came is to exacerbate even more the situation and to make situations worse than where already was in, in, in a bad uh, position where we were not able to, we will not be able to achieve uh, SG1, SG2, which is zero hunger, SG2. SG1 is about poverty reduction, extreme poverty elimination. Uh, and also the other thing that we observe is a significant increase in inequalities, uh, which also was a result of, of COVID-19, an exacerbation of inequalities. But the, the question here is, is this something new or is something that is already there? When we look at the agricultural sector, we need to understand that the agricultural sector is a sector that works under risk and uncertainties. Why? because we are vulnerable to shocks, and those shocks can be from climate, uh, some of which can be predicted and therefore can be insured. But we are also looking at shocks which are very uncertain, like COVID-19, nobody expected, and also a political economy shocks like the war and the conflicts, uh, which sometimes we cannot predict and therefore are part of the uncertainty. Uncertainty is when we cannot predict uh, the probability distribution of the damage, and therefore it's very difficult to, to put any insurance, while risk we can do that. So this agricultural sector is living in this world uh, of risk and uncertainties. In that context, if we look historically at how the market structure and taking a concept from the industrial organization, how the market structure of the exports of commodity it is in the world, and we compare 207, 208 and 211 with today, you will see that in any measurement of concentration of markets, the export, uh, the key exporting countries uh, of cereals are very few, are the top five in 207, 208, in the case of maize, represent 84% of the exports of maize. And these were the US, Argentina, Brazil, France, and India. And in the case of wheat, 63%, and this is even a lot higher in the case of rice, which is a thinner market. This high concentration on few countries being the key exporters has replicated today. And what we observe today in the case of Russian Federation and Ukraine is that they represent a significant share of the cereals in the world, cereal exports. They represent around 30% of the exports of cereals and more than 60% of the export of sunflower, for example. Now, what has been the evolution over time? And, and this graph is basically showing what has been the change since 1919 to 2019. And as you will see, uh, the US and the European Union has stayed basically the same, minus 7 million metric tons. But the big jump uh, was uh, Ukraine and Russian Federation, which increased in 66 million metric tons. While on the other hand, we see a significant reduction of 62 million metric tons in Africa and Asia. 
And this again put us in a situation where we have very few countries that have a big share in the exports of the world. And in this case, specifically, Ukraine and Russian Federation have a big share in wheat, uh, maize, and sunflower, and other cereals, but those are the, the key ones. Now, what that means is that in a world that we have risk and uncertainty, anything that happens to any of these key exporting countries automatically will have a reflection in prices and price volatility. And that's exactly what happened in 2007, 2008, exactly what happened in 2011, and exactly what is happening today. In 2007, 2008 was a climate shock, which re removed from the export world a significant share of the commodity of wheat and maize, and also rice. The same in 2011 at a lower proportion. Uh, and now it's a war, which is basically removing a share of that 30% because part of it was already exported of the world exports. And therefore, it has a correlate immediately in prices. The major difference is that today we don't have a problem in rice commodity, and that's something that we will talk later on we, because we need to be very careful with the rice commodity. And also that the commodity is there, physically there. Although the war has uh, blocked the exports of these commodities, the commodity is there. So that's something also to take into consideration. Now, why is this so risky? Because if we look at the countries that depend on the imports of wheat, for example, we have that 50 countries depend more than 30% of imports from wheat from these two countries, from Ukraine and Russian Federation. And here you have in light blue Russian Federation and in orange Ukraine. Uh, and from those 50, 30 depend more than 50%. 50 so there was a high level of dependency, which is goes against all the concept of resilience. No? Because in res if you want to be resilient, you want to diversify your imports, especially if you are import dependent. And here I put in red the African, the Sub-Saharan African countries, although the proportions are high, the level of imports of wheat is small because Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, doesn't depend too much on wheat. They, they consume more other staple, uh, cassava, but they, but they depend on oil seeds and they also depend, uh, of course, on rice, which is not the case because of, of the war, but Northern Africa for sure. The other thing I plot in this graph in the stars is the countries which are in crisis. So in red is three of the four countries with population uh, facing catastrophe. So it's IPC4 and above. In orange, IPC3 and above. And in blue countries, the four of the six countries and territories with highest numbers of internally displaced people. And as you can see, also these countries, which are already in crisis, depend a lot on the imports uh, from these two countries. And that's why it became so complex, the situation and the exacerbation of the situation because of the Ukraine war. Now, as I said before, uh, when the war started, a significant share of the exports of these two countries already were out and, and they were not hold because they were already exported. But despite that, the remaining uh, was important to be exported. But what happened also was that there were countries like India and the European Union that also uh, create a supply response and they increased the level of the they exported. And in the case of wheat, uh, India and European Union were able to increase their exports at a level that today the gap in wheat exports uh, is around 3 million metric tons. And in the right hand side, you see also Argentina, the US and South Africa responded in terms of, of exports in the case of maize. And the gap in maize today is around 8 million metric tons. Now, in this context, the other thing that is important is trade. And in this graph, uh, I am trying to bring up the comparison between uh, COVID-19, uh, between the food crisis in 2008 and between the Ukraine crisis. In the case of the crisis, uh, the food crisis of 2008, in the yellow line, you see in terms of calories traded, which is the vertical axis, and in the horizontal axis, you have the weeks, you will see an increase uh, of calories, uh, of restrictions to exports of calories traded, uh, which was going up up to 16%. And then it smoothed down and remained at a level of 12, around 12%. 12 in the case of the, of the COVID-19, we have a, a spike at the beginning, which immediately was diluted because of the information of availability of food in the world. But in the case of the, of the war in Ukraine, the red line, you see that there was a significant increase, close up to more than 17%. And then it smoothed down, but it kept high for a period of time. And now it is starting to lower down with the removal of some export restrictions. So things are improving, but still uh, there is a lot of uh, risk around and uncertainty, which could change this. But what we need is trade to flow. And that's something that, that was not happening in the, in the months after the war because of these export restrictions. Now, what this results in is prices going up. And, and here I show the FAO food price index, which has historically, his historically highest in March of this year. Uh, you have it in nominal and real terms. And now we have seen a slight reduction in the last three months. And that is mostly driven by oil seeds because of the removal of export restrictions 
uh, that had uh, affected uh, uh, improve uh, the prices. And also now we are also seeing some reduction in prices to levels at the beginning of the year uh, because of the bigger supply response and because of the flow of more grain uh, from the ports of, of Ukraine. Now, one of the things that, that we need to realize on this is that for the most vulnerable countries, it means that the global food import bill is at record levels or was at record levels high. Uh, and this means that they, they will be able to import less. And this will have an impact, especially on the poorest countries, which will have two effects, the price effect plus the devaluation of the currency effect. And also they could have also a reduction in, 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 the, in the volume they consume, because if they cannot afford, they will consume less and lower quality of food. And th that will have a significant impact uh, in terms of the food import bill of, of these countries. And if we look at the 62 most vulnerable countries, the food import bill uh, has increased in around $24.6 billion uh, only this year uh, because of these changes in prices, devaluation, and creating this impact on also on the value of what they import, but also on the quantity and the quality of what they import. Now, the fertilizer story, which is another thing that is new because on the Ukraine uh, crisis, is also a very interesting story. It's a very similar story, high concentration, very few exporters of fertilizers because they depend on natural resources in the world. But also within even the countries, you have very few companies that are basically the key exporters. And here you see it by Uria, DAP, Potash, and NPK, how in every country which is a key exporter, there are very few companies, like in Potash, uh, only one company in Canada, one company in Germany. In China, there is more. So that makes even the situation worse. And in this context, uh, Russian Federation was the is the first exporter of nitrogen, the third of, of phosphorus, and the second of, of potassium. And that made the conflict extremely problematic because fertilizers of nitrogen, especially, were not flowing out. And this creates a new link that we were not looking at it too carefully. Historically, the prices of natural gas and fertilizers were flat. And what we are observing now is that we have a new relationship between energy, especially natural gas, and nitrogen production, which is a key input for fertilizers, and that, of course, will affect food prices. And that's something extremely important to analyze because it also will be affected by the change in energy mix that we are proposing as a result, that is being proposed as a result of climate change because prices of energy will go up, and that means that fertilizer prices will go up, and that means that production of food will go up. So the picture we observe today in this context is that although the output prices are going up in the blue line, the cost of fertilizers is going higher at a higher rate up, and as a result, as you can see in the gray line, the affordability for farmers is going down, meaning that many farmers are facing a challenge in the sense that they won't be able to afford fertilizers. And this affects the next planting season. That's why our major concern today, because natural price, natural gas prices keep going up, some plants of fertilizers in the UK and in Europe are starting to close, which were key exporters of nitrogen, is that this will affect uh, the next planting season because of access to fertilizers. Not only because of the lack of flow of exports from Russian Federation, but also because of the increase in natural gas prices, which will affect the affordability. Now, what are we worried? We are worried that we will be moving from a food access crisis in 2022, which is what is happening right now, meaning that people cannot and, and most poor countries cannot afford the food because of the higher prices, to a potential availability crisis in 2023. And why is this? It's because we expect a significant reduction in the production and, of course, of the exports coming from Ukraine in cereals. Essentially, what is happening in Ukraine is production will be reduced uh, as, as in 37.2%, and that will, of course, have its correlate in exports. Not only that, farmers are deciding to move out of wheat and main, maize to sunflower because it's more profitable, and that will also affect, of course, oil seeds. In that context, if we also add the fact that the fertilizers are so expensive, that could imply that the yields for next year will be could be lower, and that could put us in a situation of food availability problem, which is what we want to avoid. And that's why it's so important to move uh, fertilizers uh, out uh, as fast as possible from the Russian Federation so that we minimize this risk. So in this context, what to do? So as I mentioned before, we need to understand that we are in a situation of risk and uncertainties. We have, of course, the humanitarian part, which we need to move very fast and, and we need to respond to minimize uh, problems of food insecurity in the countries that are affected, in the people that are affected by the terrible conflict. But we also need to look at the food and agricultural sector and the macro sector. 
In the food and agricultural sector, as I mentioned, we have the input issue, the fertilizer issue. We have the trade, and we need to avoid export restrictions. That's the worst that we can do in the current situation. We have the problems of logistics that came from even from COVID-19. We have the potential problems of diseases and the spread of diseases because Ukraine has African swine fever, for example, and if we are not careful, it could spread out. And that will be reflected. All of this is reflected in production and in prices. On the macro side, this new link between energy, not only with energy and biofuels, that it was in the 207, 208 food crisis, but also energy and input. This is central because this is not something that will stay and will stop. It's something that will continue, especially if we are thinking of changing the energy mix. The debt is extremely important and devaluation, especially for the most vulnerable countries, because if we want to assure food access, we need to allow that they have enough resources to be able to procure uh, uh, food. And of course, you have the potential risk of nuclear contamination. If, if the land is, con is, is spread with nuclear residuals, that will mean that the land of Ukraine will be off of production for a significant period of, of years, more than 10 years. And then this is all under a stress of water and under climate change. Because today, if something happens in any of the key exporting countries for the next season, outside of Ukraine and Russian Federation, which are very few, three or four countries, automatically that will create us and move us immediately into a situation which will be clearly a, a food crisis. So uh, what, what uh, FAO is, is proposing in, in this context? So of course, we, we, we have a, a big program in terms of humanitarian assistance inside Ukraine, uh, which is a rapid response to allow them to keep producing and especially to build a storage facilities so that we can compensate the gap in the storage because of the lack of mobility of grain. But our major concern right now is all the other countries that could be affected. And these are 62 countries that we have identified, countries which have our food import dependent uh, and have significant problems of balance of payments. And that is where we are proposing the food import financing facility, uh, which will help us to fund uh, th that gap in the food import bill of $24.6 billion that we need to, to cover. And we have stressed this, this, and it wouldn't create any distortion, and it will help at least this year for these countries to be able to access uh, to this food. And then the second set of recommendations is on the efficiency gains. Here, keep trade open is central. It's the only way we will be able to supply the food to the world. Just if you focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, and you look at the nine food groups that they need to have to have access to healthy diets, they don't have access to most of them. The rate of access is lower than 30%. So if there is no trade, that won't happen. So it's essential to keep trade open. The second thing is to keep information flowing, and that's where the AMIS, the agricultural market information system, is playing a role. And it's central at this point so that we don't create any, any lack of information or asymmetry that will open for speculation. And then we have the issue of the inputs. First, we are arguing that it's central uh, to let fertilizers flow, NPK, especially nitrogen. Second, it's central to increase efficiency in the way we use, and we are developing together with the US government, soil maps, nutrition soil maps that will allow to improve the blending based uh, on the experience that we have uh, from Ethiopia and other countries. But we also need to reduce food loss and waste. 30% of the, of the food is lost or wasted. Uh, and that's something that we can do policies, especially on the waste side, that will allow us to reduce waste enormously. And that's something that's an efficiency that we need to gain uh, extremely uh, urgently. And then we also need to improve the way we target social protection programs. In COVID-19, uh, many countries, especially in Latin America, uh, didn't face such a drastic problem because of these social protection program, uh, programs. But also what we are observing in many countries is that the targeting has to be adjusted. Why? Because there is a new group, especially in economies with informality, high levels of informality in Latin America, which have moved out from being non-poor to poor. And that has changed completely the focus and the hotspots of food insecurity. That's why in 2021, we see a significant increase in hunger in many of these countries, and even an increase in, in poverty. So that's something to improve the targeting of this type of policies. And of course, we need to find ways to, to reconstruct. But let me now move quickly to what is happening immediately and the Black Sea Grain Initiative, uh, and, uh, which also tries to address availability. And this is the distribution of where the new shipments are moving out, which are around 17 vessels moving out. As you can see, there is a new flow of, of availability of maize and some of wheat coming out. And this is improving availability of grain, which already the gap was very small, 3 million metric tons in wheat, as I mentioned before, and 18 maize. Now, this is not resolving the problem of access. Look at the countries that are buying most of this grain. And that's why it's so important to complement this good arrangement 
with policies to improve access. And that's where the food import facility could play a higher role. And that's what we are trying to, to, to propose. And it's something that we believe is something that the IMF can implement within the balance of payment uh, mechanism financing facility. Essentially, we try to address the root cause, which is a problem of access, because availability is there and will keep increasing as the vessels move up. Uh, we need to move uh, to avoid a problem of countries not having access to food, but also moving down into food of lower quality. And this will benefit 1.79 billion people in 62 countries, uh, and only for net food importers in low and lower middle income country groups. The total cost of the change in, in the food import bill, if we compensate 100%, which is not what we need, is $24.6 billion. But assume that we give a loan in a, in a, five, in, in a 4 or 5% interest rate, it will be a cost of $1 billion that will need to be waived at a 4% uh, discount of interest rate. And of course, it depends how much you want to cover that cost. This is the list of countries that, that will be uh, benefiting from this. And as you can see, most of them are food crisis countries in low and lower middle income, and very few that have huge balance of payments like Lebanon and so on that will need uh, their support. Here you can see geographically the target in terms of total credit volumes. And if you look at per capita uh, credit volumes, it's very, very homogeneous. So this mechanism could help. It has been a stress test, could be, have some conditionalities, and will resolve a problem that could create some social unrest. And that's basically what we need to do in the current situation. Uh, and that's where we believe it's urgent to do this. And what we are observing in terms of the vessels moving is that, again, we are resolving food availability, but not food access. And that's central right now uh, because many countries are suffering and this could create significant problems uh, of social unrest. Of course, I, I keep saying there is other efficiency gains uh, that I mentioned before, but let me stop there uh, so I can get your questions uh, and I can discuss the other recommendations. So let me stop there, Amanda, and thank you so much. So much, Maximo, um, and maybe Ian can now join us. Okay, great. So you just uh, really laid out a very complex panorama of, of events that are occurring, very interlocking markets. Um, one thing just uh, really affects the other, and I think it's important for us to to make that switch, as you're saying, between thinking about availability and overall levels of production and then who has access. Um, so let me start with asking you a little bit about the most vulnerable countries that you featured throughout your presentation. You know, they are suffering through multiple crises at baseline. They already had high levels of hunger and food insecurity and malnutrition. Um, they tend to have higher dependence on imports. You know, how how do you find those? And some of them don't have governance in place that would really enable government to be an effective interlocutor here. So how do you think the international system should be relating to the problem in those countries? You know, if we can't just, you know, deal with government as the way to handle some of these issues. Yeah. So what we need to understand, Amanda, is that these countries and many of the others have been going through a huge problem for the last two to three years because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So our countries which are in a situation of balance of payments, which doesn't allow them to have the capacity to pay this difference in, in prices, and they are also having significant problems of exchange devaluation because of the strengthening of the US dollar. So they have two effects. They have the price effect, and they also have the devaluation effect, which makes situation worse for them in terms of their import bill. Now, yes, these are countries that don't necessarily have the institutionality, but these are important countries that you don't want them to move into a situation of a food crisis. You don't want them to move from IPC3 to IPC4 and 5. That will be dramatic, and the cost for society will be a lot higher. And if you get into social unrest in these countries, then again, it will be even a higher cost. So I think if you just do simple numbers, it, these are countries that we need to support. Uh, and the position is simple for us. is You can easily calculate how much they were importing before what type of food they were importing. Because remember, we're talking of the food bill. It's not only wheat, maize, and, and sunflower. It's the whole food bill that has gone up. We can calculate that. We already have done it. And we need to help them. Okay. Now, if we give them a loan to pay later, two years later, we're talking of $1 billion of subsidy, which is nothing. Okay. But this will at least help them to cope for a short period of time with the situation that we are facing now until prices settle more and there is more food availability. But that, that is, I think, essential right now. So it's a priority to, to be done, no matter the potential risk of institutionality behind. Great, and let me ask you a follow-up question to that. You mentioned the balance of payments issues. 
I mean, why is the proposed FIF different from existing IMF facilities? And I mean, if you look at what's happening with the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust or GRA, those are the different mechanisms that the IMF has has to provide existing balance of payments support. I mean, we have seen those amounts fall since the peak in 2020 and the demand on the part of countries, we're not sure what's happening with that, but you can see that the disbursements are lower, that the use of the facilities is lower. So tell me a little bit about why not the existing tools, um, why this new mechanism, um, and then, you know, is it that countries also aren't foreseeing the problem enough so that they're not sort of going to the IMF and saying, I need this, I need to prepare in this way? What do you think? So uh, I think the, the difference is, we, we tried to set up the food import financing facility so that it matches the logic of the balance of payment financing facility mm -hmm. so that the structure is the same. So we respect the Bretton Woods agreement and so on. And the difference is that here you're targeting food issues. So mm -hmm. it's a very focused target initiative, uh, which have conditionalities that will assure that we increase resilience in the future. Uh, that's the big difference. If you give money for balance of payments, then it can be spread out into different elements that will create other potential uh, disruptions. No, like, for example, subsidies, you know, mm -hmm. many of the IFIs now are doing programs of subsidies on fertilizers, which is a big mistake mm -hmm. because the problem in fertilizers is a supply problem. It's not a demand problem. And if you subsidize, you will just put more pressure on prices and misallocation of resources. So again, we are targeting the, the, the structural problem, which is lack of access of food. Mm -hmm. Very targeted, a stress test, not distortion, it could help and is resolving the problem uh, of, of lack of capacity of, of access. That's the difference. There are many, there are some countries which are already going into this type of arrangements, like the World Bank is supporting, I think, Lebanon, the IMF is supporting mm -hmm. Egypt and so on bilaterally. No, Our position is, okay, we have technically assessed and there are 62 countries, the list I show, mm -hmm. why we don't target the package and try to minimize this potential risk uh, that could create social unrest. Maxima, I wonder if I could jump in with a question. It was it was great to hear you describe the, the commonalities and differences with the previous price spikes. You know the ones we saw in 07 and 08, mainly about shortfalls in supply that was climate driven, but at least in 07 08 also coinciding with a with an energy price spike, albeit one that that disappeared. I guess one of one thing I've observed since the start of this crisis is you know everybody's very focused on the, understandably on the security situation in Ukraine and. Maybe if this food crisis is happening on its own without that, then there may be more, it'd be more attention on it. Um, can you just say a little bit more about how you envisage this prices evolving into the into the next season and you know how fertilizer prices will feed into farming decisions and, and what that will mean for the price level? You know, some people are saying that the Ukraine, the effect of the war on prices has you know, dissipated. Um, but, but put into context for us how, how long this crisis might go on for and, and how difficult it might be. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Ian. So let, let me let me be very clear on, on, on how I see the, the differences, which are, I think, different than before. No? So first problem is we remove a share of exports from the world because of the war. But in difference to the past, the grain is there. OK, so it's just like virtually yeah. removed, but physically is there. OK, so there we need to be careful because already there has been a supply response. So other countries like India, for example, have exports. So the gap is very small. So today, if you tell me even without the agreement, prices were already starting to fall. OK, because there was a supply response. The gap was three million metric tons in wheat and 18 maize. Now, what the agreement is doing is facilitating that even more because it's moving grain out, especially maize and, and some wheat. But we need to be careful because in any of these things, there are two, two sides of the coin. In parallel, we have an increase in fertilizer prices. So farmers today are trying to pay this high cost despite prices are not so high relative to the fertilizer price increase. So if prices fall too much, so for example, if we move out more than 3 million metric tons of wheat, then we will be exporting more than we exported the previous year to the war. And that could make prices even fall more and that could affect producers also. Okay. Yes, consumers could be better because prices are lower. But again, if we don't resolve the food access problem, the ones that really need won't be better off. So again, it's a great idea, what has, a great deal what has happened now, but needs to complement with other policies to improve also food access for the most vulnerable, which is what we care right now. Okay, so that's one, one first issue. 
The second issue is the issue of the linkage between natural gas and fertilizers. And that's what worries us the most, because that is affecting the next planting season. Why? Because if nitrogen prices continue to go up, natural gas is going up. So food prices are now at the levels before the war, January or December of last year. But natural gas is still going up. If Europe has to make choices, which was an exporter of nitrogen, like the UK, they close a plant of fertilizers. Germany is closing another one and there will be other plants being closed. Mm. Then more press pressure on the supply side of nitrogen. That will affect more the prices of fertilizers and that will affect more the planting in the next year planting season. Now, we are not so concerned on wheat, maize and soybeans uh, for the next year. Our major concern is the commodity that has not been affected right now, which is rice. Because what we are observing in rice right now is that the planting is going a little bit down and prices are starting to get more volatile. Now, why rice is so important? Because if I need to care of a commodity for sub-Saharan Africa, where most of the food crises are, is rice. Mm -hmm. Africa is the highest importer of rice in the world. Okay, so if because of the high cost of fertilizers, rice producers are finding this not, not affordable, not profitable, they will reduce supply. And that can put a commodity which has been great because many of the improvements of many countries like Indonesia, Bangladesh, and so on in, in getting surpluses to export could be affected. And that's what I worry. So if you tell me today where I will distribute the fertilizers that I, we have, I will put in key producers of, of rice. Okay. And then move to the key mm -hmm. producers of, of, of uh, staples. Uh, that's where they, they, you, you want that to happen. So the linkage between energy and, and fertilizer, especially nitrogen, which is the one that depletes the fastest, is central. Of course, we can gain efficiencies like what we're trying to do with soil mass, but that's more a medium long term. But that's the concern that we have uh, uh, for, for next year. So that, that's the difference. No, So I, I believe that fertilizers are starting to move out uh, with, the, with the letters of comfort of the U.S., and the help to avoid using the sanctions because food and fertilizers are not part of the sanctions for the US and for Europe. But of course, there is a lot of risk for traders to do this because they could fall into a problem with the SWIFT and so on. So the comfort letters is helping for that and the guidance is helping for that. But despite that, and we have more availability, the prices are still too high. And that's what needs to be resolved. And that's also a lesson learned for the future because if we are going to change the energy mix in the future, what we are learning now <clears throat> is that we need to be careful because that has a trade-off over fertilizer prices and it will have a trade-off over food. So let's assess those trade-offs so that we can make the best pathways. I am completely on board to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we need to be careful because you can reduce greenhouse emissions but increase the nourishment even more. So that, that's the, the trade-off that we need to carefully assess. Thanks, Maximo. And uh, to our viewers, if you can please uh, put comments and questions in underneath the YouTube stream or via Twitter on hashtag CGD chat uh, talks rather. Let me ask you, you showed us some interest that, that, you know, you showed us so many different sources of data, obviously like on commodity markets, the data is pretty good. It's pretty real time. What about what's happening in countries amongst, you know, families and households? How good is the data there? You know, there were a lot of uh, kind of modeling exercises that happened uh, at the start of the Ukraine conflict that were trying to help us anticipate what would be the effect of some of these measures. You know, how good is the empirical data in terms of knowing what's going on really in people's <clears throat> lives? Uh, what do you see needs to be done to improve that empirical data? to inform decisions and you know better target the safety net, for example, as you are proposing? Look, uh, to, to be very honest on this, I think if we compare the situation we have today in terms of tools and data, the presence of AMIS and what happened in 2007, 2008, I think that we are a lot better prepared in terms of mm -hmm. information, okay? Mm -hmm. Normally we blame data, but I, I don't <laughs> think today that's the problem. I think today the problem is coordination and policy. Mm -hmm. uh, look, in, in terms of, of, of data, uh, we now collect uh, in most countries of the world the FIES, the Food Insecurity Experience Scale, mm -hmm. which is a very short survey. Even we were very successful on moving uh, to digital a collection of data because mm -hmm. of COVID-19. So we learn a lot. Uh, and that allows us to have a better picture of what is the level of severe food insecurity, which is equivalent mm -hmm. to chronic undernourishment, and moderate food insecurity, which tells us under and overnutrition. Uh, and for example, it has helped us enormously to identify uh, why in Latin America hunger is increasing so much uh, during COVID-19, which essentially was an issue of informal sector 
being mm -hmm. destroyed because of the lockdowns and killing all their working capital. And this was a sector that was not poor and now is moving into poverty and potentially extreme poverty. So I think we're doing better. Also, we have all the elements of the APC, uh, which they collect data for a significant number of countries. Uh, and this is the acute food insecurity data together with WFP, FAO, and all, FUSENET, and all the agencies involved. So there is a very clear procedure and protocol to collect that data that allow us to know which countries in, in IPC5, IPC4, IPC3, mm -hmm. and above. We are now, uh, there is an agreement between all the agencies to expand the coverage of countries, so to move from around 50 to 80 countries, uh, which will help us to have a very consistent set of information. Okay, but we must understand that acute food insecurity is a short-term effect mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. uh, of a conflict or internal conflict or the war, but it's not a permanent effect. Chronic undernourishment is more structural. No? So if you don't take care of acute food insecurity, you can end in chronic undernourishment. So I think in terms of data, we are moving, although, of course, it's essential to get more resources to do it. My position was in COVID-19 was, OK, you are doing all these programs, but you don't know where you are targeting the money. Mm -hmm. And many countries mm -hmm. were wasting, my own country, they waste enormous amount of money on transfers. And they were not targeting the people that were in the new hotspots of food insecurity. And mm -hmm. we did an exercise for, for a few countries in Latin America, and we showed that the targeting was the traditional rosters of, of extreme poverty, but was not targeting this new informal sector that was completely losing everything. And they needed mm -hmm. to get help because they don't have financial access. So targeting has to improve, and a huge investment on improving and collecting more of this data, the subnational level will be central. We always look, collecting the fees data for 30 countries, we're talking of $10 million. Yeah, and that's where easily for donors they can do that, uh, and they will improve targeting. They will help countries to target even Europe and the US. You need better targeting mm -hmm. even in those countries. So, so <laughs> again, it's not an expensive tool, but it's very difficult uh, uh, to sell that to the constituencies, no? To sell that these data have an impact. But if you calculate the amount of inefficiency of allocation of resources because you didn't have proper targeting, it's enormous. Uh, so again, we need to find ways in which we can sell this better to, to the donor world uh, so that they understand how important this is. Yeah. Can you say something about the frequency of those kinds of surveys? Because, of course, we have the living standards and measurement surveys. We have the censuses around the world. And I mean, you know, let's say uh, your country, which we will not name, but, <laughs> you know, they have a poverty map that's based on census plus an LSMS type survey. Um, that's how they construct their rosters. But of course, poverty is much more dynamic. As you're saying, these effects are in real time and, and require some more agile targeting. So, you know, what would you hope to see at the country level in terms of So the, the, the frequency data? of the of the fee is we collect it every year, but it's at the global level. It's at aggregate level by country. So the representation mm -hmm. is at the level of the country. The ideal thing would be to have a subnational level representation, which we only have mm -hmm. for a few countries. Now, uh, in terms of poverty maps, uh, there is a lot of innovation happening there. So yes, uh, my country has a census, but they collect household surveys that allow mm -hmm. to interpolate and to do traditional poverty mapping. For Africa, for example, now we are working with Stanford and we have more real time. Uh, we don't call them poverty maps because those are official, mm -hmm. but let's call them welfare maps that allow mm -hmm. us to predict where the new hotspots of poverty will be. And that's what we are using for our our geographical targeting right now. So, mm -hmm. so I think technology allows us to to move faster uh, and we have validated this uh, for nigeria for example we have a very detailed poverty map some national level we validated with this new type of map uh, and the correlations were extremely high in the space so so i think that's what we need no we need to improve on tools but we need to improve on modeling and all these kinds of things mm -hmm. that requires money uh, mm -hmm. the problem is very difficult to sell uh, because why me as a as a country will invest in modeling uh, which could create some, some, some uh, don't have something to, to justify to my constituency. So I think we need a lot of help on this, on how to market this better, because the returns could be significantly higher. Let, let me just add something to that. So the issue of trade-offs that I was mentioning is not a simple issue, OK? Mm -hmm. we, we tried to push the concept of trade-offs in the Food System Summit of last year. And it was so complex for people to understand trade-offs. Uh, uh, we even are doing a game now on that to, to, to show what it implies. Uh, but it's so essential. Uh, because we are making decisions on the blind spot. We, we are not looking at the consequences of our actions. Okay. And everything, as we can see now, after COVID-19 and, and now with the energy relationship with food, any, everything is interlinked. And that requires complex global models with the sectors inside that will allow us to measure those trade-offs so that you can understand what is the pathway that will allow you to achieve your objective function with the minimum trade-offs. No? 
Mm -hmm. And when you say trade-offs, you're talking about, for example, between emissions reduction and production of fertilizer, things like that? Externalities, yeah. exactly. So yeah. assume that I want to achieve uh, zero hunger, okay? Mm -hmm. To achieve zero hunger, I could do several things. I could do more intensity production mm -hmm. that will have an effect over soil, over land, over water. I can do less intensity production. I can increase livestock, for example. We know there is a, a deficit in demand of livestock for the future that could create more greenhouse gas emissions. So all those are trade-offs. Mm -hmm. A change in the energy mix will create trade-offs over fertilizers and, of course, over food production and over nutrition and hunger. So, so again, if we are going to decide a change in energy mix as a global policy, mm -hmm. okay, what are the trade-offs of that and what we can do to compensate or what are the pathways we need to achieve or how fast we need to move to minimize those trade-offs over time? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think the sustainable development goals definitely need an assessment of trade-offs in every country. I hope you are prosper with that model and way of thinking. Um, oh, back to you, Ian, I, I, you know, just to say, so we've seen those four plans. You have a new proposal. What our question, uh, uh, go ahead, Ian. Thanks, Amanda. We're starting, Max, we're starting to get a couple of questions from the audience, which we'll come on to in a moment. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch, you, you set out um, both in global markets and in terms of food fertilizer production, that there's this concentration. And, you know, we've had we've had three spikes now in 15 years after only having, I don't know, one in 40 years before that. So mm -hmm. so there's a sensitivity in global markets. This year, we've, we haven't had any climate problems, thank goodness. But next year, we could. Just at the important moment of the question. <laughs> yeah, I think he was looking to climate shocks. And if yeah, you want, uh, I can try to predict. Yes, go ahead. Question, go but, ahead. <laughs> uh, but but that, that's, I, I think what, what Ian is raising is exactly the point I, I mentioned, I, I tried to mm -hmm. mention at the beginning. Uh, agriculture is a sector that will be shocked by climate. And, and, and climate impacts uh, could be affecting key exporting countries. Uh, could also change problems in terms of how diseases will spread. Mm -hmm. And that could also affect production of food. Uh, so, yes, we have a huge risk and uncertainty. Uh, the problem is the way the work operates right now is that you have very few key exported countries of cereals, uh, which is the major commodity we're discussing. And unless we increase the number of big countries exporting these commodities, we won't be able to diversify. What you want in a world like this, mm -hmm. in a sector like this, is what is the, the, the solution? When you have a portfolio of investment, you diversify your portfolio, no? That's exactly what we need to do in agriculture. We need to think in agriculture in a world and the risk and uncertainty. So we need to change the way we think of this sector. And we need to find ways in which we can diversify across the world. So yes, in Africa, there are two or three or four countries that can play a huge role in terms of surpluses of food. If we transform those sectors and we do the agri-food system transformation that is needed. Also in Asia, you have seen what happened in Bangladesh, for example, is now a an exporter of rice. Mm -hmm. The same in, in Indonesia is self-sufficient in rice. So that those changes is what you are looking for. So mm -hmm. big countries exporting more. And that's what we need. And the other thing that we need is, of course, is uh, to what we call in the last uh, SOFI publication is repurposing of subsidies. So the incentives that we have today are not aligned to the message of healthier diets, to the message mm -hmm. of lower over and undernutrition. They are aligned to subsidize staples, to create distortions in the market, in the export mm -hmm. market, and in the way we produce. So we need to assess that. And that is mostly developed countries. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily developing countries because the amount of subsidy in developing countries is a lot lower. And therefore, in developing countries, the problem is more how we support the consumers to have better choices. But in developed countries, it's an issue of supply. So unless we start to assess that and, and again, look carefully at the, at the consequences of our actions, we won't be able to change mm -hmm. this. I think that's a really important point and a, a question, you know, that a lot of the system, the international system set up today is focused on the needs of low and middle income countries, which is appropriate. But actually what we're seeing is this requires policy attention in high income countries, which is, that's why this is a good platform for you to come and speak and make that point. And I think that's, uh, you know, you can imagine some uh, reform lending, for example, um, in some of these areas. Can I ask you a related question? You talked about the highly concentrated markets in uh, producing countries of these different um, crops and things like that. Um, can, can you say, like, what is it that you would expect countries to do to reduce that extremely high level of concentration? 
And oh. then second, we have such a good question that I have to say it right away from our, our colleague and non-resident fellow, uh, Chris Lane. He's asking, where does the IMF stand on the proposed food import financing facility? Okay, so on the first one, I think is is very important to 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 start working uh, in the transformation of the agri food system of the countries that have this potential. No, mm -hmm. you so if you compare what happened as a consequence of 2007 to 8 was Brazil basically. Mm -hmm. So Brazil started to become a key ticket supporter of these commodities and, and reduce the concentration level. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we need now. So how investments can be done through the IFIs to support that, I think, is the goal. The, the, the issue here is we need to have a very clear objective function in mind. Mm -hmm. It's not just doing little things here and little things there, which at the end get wiped off and nothing happened. If the objective function is to invest the little resources we have in the world, uh, to diversify this sector, I think is, is central, and that's what we need to do. In parallel to that, uh, these efficiency gains are essential. So reduction mm -hmm. of waste is, I think, is a triple win. No? Uh, mm -hmm. Use better natural resources, reduce emissions, because a lot of, of landfills are burned, and that creates even more emissions, uh, and more efficiency for, for, for access to food to, to people. So I, again, there are very clear wins that we can do uh, to help to, to increase the surpluses and, and, and minimize the pressure over this sector. In terms of the of, of the import in financing facility, so the import financing facility has been presented by the Director General of FAO in, in the finance group of the G20, mm -hmm. uh, both in Washington, in Indonesia, uh, has been presented to the G7. Uh, the IMF, of course, is, is part of that. Uh, and uh, that, that's exactly what we hope uh, the IMF will pick this up. Our position is this is not something that FAO should implement, not at all. This is something that is designed for a place like the IMF to implement, and we are there to provide all the technical support. Any tweak, any ad adjustment, we are more than happy because we handle this sector, we know the sector, and we have the data on this sector. So for us, it's straightforward to calculate these things and, and to provide that type of information. So let's hope that this is picked up uh, uh, and is moved forward, but it's still we have not received yet uh, that type of technical discussions that we are hoping to have soon. What What would be the timeline that you would hope to see on that? No, this has to be as soon as possible. So mm -hmm. right now, the, the G20 of Indonesia, the finance group, decided to start to explore, uh, and that was a summary because they couldn't agree to until the statement, to start to explore a food import financing facility similar to the WHO one. No? Uh, mm -hmm. But again, this is, for us, uh, is something that needs to move extremely fast because despite the prices are going down, still they are high, and these countries are really facing challenges. And you don't want to end in situations that uh, could create social unrest in many of these countries, which are really needed. No? Ian's back. Go ahead, Ian. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, yeah, I think you got the gist of it, Maximo, which is which is great. And um, we've got some good questions coming in. So let me put a couple of those to you. Um, one is from Alice Klein, and she says, um, um, you mentioned some of the countries shifting to cheap imported calories. Um, what, what foods do you mean as, as cheap import, imported um, food? No, it means that pro, uh, starchy products, no? products that are uh, lower nutritious content. And, and of course, you know, even at the individual level, no, when price of food goes up, you will buy cheaper food. No? Uh, and therefore, your diet will be affected and you will gain overweight. No? So, so that's exactly what you want to avoid. So many countries are starting to lower the quality of what they import in terms of the food import bill, and that could affect, uh, of course, uh, we'll have a intertemporal location problem because it will not only affect on the nourishment, but also overnourishment, which normally we don't discount to present value, no? Mm -hmm. Which has a consequence over health. No? And Amanda knows that better than me. <laughs> Uh, we also have a question about the productivity of agriculture over time in sub-Saharan Africa. What's the dynamic there? How does this contribute to what we're seeing today? Look, sub-Saharan Africa, and this is something to, to have it clear, 3% of the, they, they only use 3% of fertilizers. So basically, the intensity of use of fertilizers is very low in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. So for them, the challenge right now is for, for some of the production side, of course, if they don't have affordability, the little they use, they will have to use less, and that will affect even more productivity. Uh, but uh, the, the level in terms of productivity, I think there are significant yield gaps right now. And that is also linked to technology and to innovation, and it's also linked to institutionality. No? So technology in the agricultural system has been moving forward. Uh, but as you know, even uh, 
gene editing is still not allowed in, in Europe. No? Uh, so, so that's something that requires uh, to learn what are the effects, the consequences, what are the risks, and do proper risk assessments, and to help countries to build institutionality to avoid any potential problem of using those type of technologies. But the gap is, is enormous. But one important thing in, in Africa is that the fertilizer question. No? Mm -hmm. So when I was in, in, in the board of the World Bank, one of the things that we put a lot of stress was on building the Dangote plant of fertilizers in Nigeria. Uh, and because that plant was supposed to supply fertilizers to all Africa, they have the capacity, they have the natural mm -hmm. resource. But when you ask today to the Dangote plant where the fertilizers are going, 95.5% are going to Latin America, which for the business is okay because they are getting what they need, but it doesn't make any sense that doesn't go to Africa. So instead mm -hmm. of investing in subsidies, I think, in, in fertilizers in Africa, which we have seen like in many countries, the problems that that has generated to, to the balance of payments and so on, is important, at least for my impression, is why you don't resolve the problem of why the Dangote plan is not selling to Africa. Mm -hmm. What is the problem? It's a problem of transportation. It's a problem mm -hmm. of trade barriers. It's a problem of, of, of lack of resources to buy the insurance that you need to buy to be able mm -hmm. to procure. What is wrong? So focus mm -hmm. on the structural problem. Try to resolve the problem because the investment there is huge. Uh, and it could provide supply most of the fertilizer Africa needs right now. So. So those are the types of, of market issues, market failures that can be resolved, I hope. Uh, but we need to assess them and need to figure out what is the problem. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really important point. And I think, you know, uh, we're looking at vaccine manufacturing investments, for example, also in sub-Saharan African countries and, and learning from this experience on fertilizer seems super important. Can I just go back to one point that you were making earlier? You, you know, I think, you know, many of these big institutions like the IMF or the World Bank, they work on a country by country basis and, a, you know, specific countries demand for certain kinds of um, lending and technical assistance projects. But you're you're also saying we're, we're being affected by these big global trends and uh, dynamics. It affects a group of countries. Um, how, you know, do, do does the IMF or the World Bank need new mechanisms to relate to these uh, effects, these these phenomena that are really affecting more than one country at once. Um, because I think that's part of, you know, the slowness or the lack of looking at the whole system um, that we sometimes see. And, you know, we, we saw something like that in the COVID-19 vaccine response, for example. Um, it, again, it was country by country. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a problem. Uh, and I think the way to look at this is coordination. No? Uh, mm -hmm. For me, what we have right now is a coordination failure. Uh, mm -hmm. There are efforts trying to resolve this, but still there is a huge coordination failure. Uh, and as a result of that, agencies that specialize in topic A are doing ABC, which is a mistake because they don't know BC and they think mm -hmm. they know, but they don't. And therefore they create a problem rather than create a solution. So I, I think that is uh, to, to, to do what you are specialized for and what your mandate is helps. But if you improve coordination, then you can gain complementarities. The same applies uh, if you look country by country mm -hmm. and regional. Look, one of the topics that for me it came very clear in COVID-19 is the importance of intra-regional trade. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a way in which countries could have resolved the problem of long value chains versus short value chains. And when I refer to short, I am talking of global value chains. So they cross at least three borders. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am not referring to autarky, which it doesn't work. That, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, so, and, and where we see that despite there are some interregional trade agreements like the Africa Free Trade Agreement, uh, they are not yet operational. Even in Central America, long years approved is not yet operational. And what are the major barriers? It's not necessarily tariffs. It's also non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. So having a, a, a Pan-African Food Safety Agency, for example, is central so that you have a common standard which will allow commodities to move. It's also central to minimize risk of uh, animal diseases and the spread mm -hmm. of animal diseases. So I think those regional common global public goods are central mm -hmm. and we are not investing in those. And those are the ones that will help us to allow us to re increase our resilience. So I think, yes, you need to have, of course, you need to have a country approach because countries have needs and they have mm -hmm. problems which are specific to the countries. But you need to understand that this world is interlinked, uh, is interlinked in trade, is interlinked in health and so on and so forth. I even right now, uh, as I mentioned, Ukraine has African swine fever. If we're not careful and the border mm -hmm. countries don't put the measures to, of surveillance to, to minimize that risk, then it could be a, a problem that will spread in, in Europe. So those are the issues that we need to think regionally and think of regional public goods. 
in infrastructure that is also core, is central, especially when you have landlocked countries. No? You need to have an approach which is more regional or sub-regional than just to have a country level approach. Well, I think this is a really good place to end with a call for more attention to regional public goods. Um, we will keep uh, talking to you over the next couple of months to hear what happens with the proposal that the FAO has made. Um, and Ian, any final closing comments as we say goodbye? I'll just briefly take the chance to say, well, I mean, the, um, your point, Maximo, on, on agricultural subsidy and, and, and its repurposing, I mean, you know, it's, it's something, even in the OECD, it's something like $245 billion a year, mm -hmm. which is more than the global aid budget. And how much discussion is there of how well that money is used? What has it done in this crisis, you know, to help? And yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to focus a few more people on, on that question. So that's a, that's, a, that's a really helpful steer. Yeah, you've really laid out a, a very comprehensive agenda. And of course, we totally agree with your vision uh, of the world in this way of the interlinkages and of course the trade-offs in terms of reaching all of these really important global goals. So thanks so much, Maximo, for joining us today. And um, thanks to you and the audience for listening. Thank you. Bye.